Hi, Eleanor. I'm Michael. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for asking. Oh, one question. Where am I? Who are you and what's going on? Right. So, you, Eleanor Shellstrop, are dead. Your life on Earth has ended, and you are now in the next phase of your existence in the universe. Cool. Cool. I have some questions. Thought you might. <laughs> Podcast, the weekly pseudo academic roundtable of pop culture analysis with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav, and I am once again here with my co hosts, Wayne and Hannah. How's it going, guys? Hey, Mav. Hannah's sad and has not answered. Well, I don't know how to feel because, on the one hand, I'm deeply saddened by the fact that the good place is over, which we'll get to in a minute. But on the other hand, Kesha just released. Her new album, High Road, and it is very fun. This is a, see, I, I I was like all planning to have this secretly. We're going to talk about the good place, and it was going to be secretly my chance to segue into a whole Riverdale thing. But is this like your way of secretly trying to trick us into talking about Kesha? Yes, I don't think it's a secret. I'm always trying to secretly <laughs> trying to get you to talk about Kesha. Like I was literally like listening to Kesha while working on my dissertation and uh, playing with my cats. Like it's just like what I do. <laughs> Uh, I guess there'll be a Kesha show someday, but not today. <laughs> so <laughs> today's topic is the end of the second best show on television. Best show on television. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. <laughs> come on. It was the end of the good place. Or like um, good show. It, it, it was a good show. I enjoyed it. We'll get into that. But we, you know, just because we have a bunch of people here, I want to make sure we introduce all of the yeah, guests. We're back in my philosophy class. <laughs> oh, uh, you have to tell that story in a moment. But uh, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to welcome back uh, Marcel Walker. Hey, Marcel. Hello, friends. How are you? <laughs> Hi, welcome. Welcome. So uh, you're a fan of Russell. Riverdale? <laughs> I'm a fan no, of you're a, fan, uh, you're a fan of the good I'm, place. I'm a fan of all intelligent TV plus Riverdale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never said it was intelligent television. I said it was the best. Uh, but you asked to be on this. Um, you found out it's like, oh, you're doing a show on the good place. I I need to be there. Well, that and Wayne just kind of I think knew because he knows. I mean, it's um, you know, and it's funny because I fell into the good place a little late. I didn't watch. I think the whole first season. I think it was into the second season before I was watching it. And then, which is kind of nice because then I was able to just sort of watch all those mm-hmm. earlier episodes. Like I didn't have to wait and just go, go, yeah. go. So yeah, same here. I didn't come into it till like third season or something. I did something similar. I watched the first episode the night it premiered. Um, I think I was busy whenever the second episode came on. And then I was just like, I'll catch up on that. I'll catch up on that. And everybody's like, this is amazing. I'll, I'll catch up. And then eventually, like right after the first season ended, I, you know, I just binged it. So. I watched it when it came out. And uh, it was actually right when I started writing my dissertation. I was reading Kant's The Metaphysics of Morals. And if you remember the first episode, guess what book they reference and what uh, what problematic fave philosopher they talk about. And I was like, this is a sign from the well, universe. Before we get into details like that, we should introduce <laughs> the other two guests. True. <laughs> uh, two people returning both. Well, one and a half of the regulars of the of, of the protagonist podcast are good friends over there. We have both Joe and John Dorowski, which is going to confuse the hell out of me on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> Hello, thank you for having us. Hi, Mav and everyone. Uh, yeah, so twice the Dorowski fun of. <laughs> um, and and they agree with me that the good place is better than Riverdale. Well, they're wrong, but well, I, <laughs> but I but I like them anyway. <laughs> I think now we can put a caveat on this. The good place was the best show that was on television. The Riverdale is the best show that is on television. Well, the words "manimal" fit. You know, I don't. <laughs> wow, we haven't oh, made an animal reference in ages. That, that's no, great. we haven't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys are both 
both fans of the show. Uh, yeah, I started watching it. Uh, I saw the pilot and I, I actually uh, stuck through, but then I did a, a rewatch of everything of the first three seasons heading into season four. So mm-hmm. I've, I've done both versions of waiting week to week and also binging it. Which is better? Um, I think I actually prefer week to week that rather than binging mm-hmm. it. Because I, I like thinking about what's going to happen instead of just immediately hitting the button and say, tell me what happens now. <laughs> <laughs> it's also nice to sometimes sit with the ideas that they present for a little bit instead of mm-hmm. going right into it. Uh, it was on Joe's recommendation that I started watching. And I forget when I watched it, if it was binging the first season or start, uh, binging a few episodes of the first season and then catching up on the rest of it week by week. I don't remember exactly what format I did, but I, what I do remember is that this was when I was a graduate teaching assistant and we just had one big office for all the teaching assistants. And I told everyone in the office, you need to go watch the show. And none of them did. I'm like, I need <laughs> someone to talk to, talk to, to the, with it, about the show with, and none of them would do it. So I'm very glad that I now have a chance to talk about it like this. This is like a show for academics. And I, I would show him clips saying, look, at, they're talking about all the philosophers that we talk about. <laughs> oh, we, you need to watch this. And they, none of them would believe me. Oh, people. Um. <laughs> <laughs> this was all during the first season. I don't know if they've caught up since, yeah. but it was very frustrating mm-hmm. in the first season that no one was watch- also there was watching it so that we could all talk about it. Mm-hmm. This was the same for me at Duke. I went, and then like, I think after the first season ended, a lot of people caught up and they were like, Hannah, that show you were right. Like some people were like, I'm even thinking about writing about it. And I was like, yeah, I told you so. I, I don't know what just, people think of bad taste. I'm out of touch with a lot of network TV. And I just, I was, if I had heard of it, I just remained kind of unconscious of it for a long time. And then finally it, it hit that you know, 100th monkey of someone recommending it to me. <laughs> Under the monkey. Invent a phrase. Is this a phrase? No, 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 that's a phrase everybody knows. There's that breaking point where you know a hundred monkeys learn to do something, then every monkey in the world knows how to do it. It's just not like a, a combination of of typing Shakespeare and dancing on the head of a pen and like and the tipping point. Back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a tipping point. It's a hundredth monkey. It's, okay. it's a thing. Look sure. it up. <laughs> but, he, but eventually, I, uh, I, you know, I discovered it and really glad I did. But it, it, like toward the end of second season, beginning of third, before I even do a thing. Okay. Yeah, but and that's, that's kind of when re-watch? Marcel and I started watching it. Oh, do you watch it together? Yeah. For listeners who don't know, Marcel and Wayne are roommates, so it's it's yeah. convenient for them to do so. Oh, oh <laughs> right, no, yeah. like the yeah. hundredth monkey is a real thing. Did you just it's go a real it? thing. <laughs> 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 it's called the hundred month hundredth monkey effect. It's like According to Wikipedia, the hypothetical phenomenon which a new behavior or idea is said to spread rapidly by unexplained means for one group to all related groups once a critical number of members of one group exhibit the new behavior or acknowledge the new idea. So now check, the, check the date stamp and make sure that Wayne didn't just write that an hour ago. Monkeys on the island were washing their fruit. And, and this has never no, been this, done before. No, this is like a, and then, no, this and then like somewhere, a from the 80s. And, and then somewhere oh. they realized that now every monkey in the world was doing this exact thing. So there, there was a so critical now, mass that happened. <laughs> now little, we got a little known, link to the 100th monkey in the show notes. <laughs> well, little, little known fact, Wayne and I also own 99 monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Are they in a barrel? <laughs> well... I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna disclose all of that. Would be, <laughs> that would be embarrassing. Oh, okay. Um, and you know, this is actually going about how philosophy class in college went. Just yeah, you should explain. Okay. You should explain that reference because you told us off air. Uh, yes. So uh, my senior year of college, I took a philosophy class that was not intro to logic, and it was me and literally six guys and a male professor who was very into Foucault, and <laughs> we studied feminism, and it went about how you'd expect um (laughs) uh which actually like for the side note um i really appreciated the good place introducing introducing hypatia of alexandria in the second to last episode um because my gateway into philosophy actually was in middle school we had to pick an ancient philosopher learn their philosophy as it was and act it out and i was like i'm not playing a dude because they're boring uh i actually discovered hypatia's philosophy um such that is and her life story so i was very excited that like this was a thing and we weren't just talking about Plato again. Mm-hmm. We should um, 
just for for listeners um, who have not figured this out yet, this is one of those episodes where we are, you know, warning 10 minutes into the episode, we are going to spoil the fuck out of this show because it's over now and it has been for, you know, three whole days as we record this. So please get off the air and watch it. Uh, You don't want it spoiled, (laughs) especially like, I mean, the first couple of seasons rely on big twists and they're really rewarding. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yes. If you're not spoiled, but they are rewarding to rewatch and like see how it all fits together. Um, so binge four, four seasons of television and then come back and listen to this episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Seasons. So you yeah, can do it in a week. Yeah. <laughs> and they're only like, you know, 20 minute episodes generally. And uh, Hypatia of Alexandria is not a spoiler, though. You should go read about her life because she is awesome. <laughs> she would be in the good place. So, I mean, this is obviously this is Hannah, what you've said on this show before that this is basically your favorite show ever. Right. Like that when you say when you say best show on television, you're you mean it. (laughs) Yes, I generally I I mean, I mean, I I really I've said before Lost, I think, is very close and means a lot to me because it was like one of the first like real network television shows I actually watched in real time. And it like I created Lost very similar to The Good Place. And I think they hold some similarities, which we can get into later discussing this. Um, and I thought that Watchmen was really great, but that is more of a mini series, at least right now. Um, but this this like has everything. It has mm-hmm. Kant. It has <laughs> mutual aid. It asks big <laughs> questions. It has hilarious jokes that are both about Kant and not. Um, and, and it has that thing where the midget is in the is in the restaurant. And uh, I don't know. You have to be an SL fan in order to get the <laughs> stuff on. <laughs> um, I mean, like, who doesn't want to like live in the world that was created by this show? Well, maybe I not that. Maybe not I the do. bad place. Maybe not the bad place. <laughs> I, I, I like this show a lot. I don't know that I want to live in that world, well, but I think well, that's an interesting live, question. But live, I mean, like fictionally, like you know, spend some time with the characters we know, watch their adventures. I don't want to live in Star Wars. It seems like they have a new conflict every twenty years. But will I go watch any new Star Wars movie? Of course I will. Even Solo, which was very boring. Well, so, I, so Hannah, I don't you're know. saying you want to live in a world where there's a digital assistant that serves your every whim and gives you everything you need with the moment you ask for it. Except for you said you'd hate that. Like <laughs> Hannah, Hannah is the person who refuses to have, uh, refuses to have any smart home devices in her house because you don't want them listening. And Janet can hear everything. No, 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 no. I do. I do though. I have, yeah, I have an iPhone. I have a laptop. Like I just don't want Alexa because it makes me feel better. I know that like private companies are surveilling me all the time. I just feel better about it because they're not like Janet and just good faith actors. So those, those, uh, type of machines don't give you the things instantaneously. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't give us cactuses when we ask for water. It's all about the instant gratification here. <laughs> oh, that's um, I can figure out the instant well, gratification. Also, They'll give also, it to this you. This episode turned into a psychoanalysis of me, not the TV show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sorry, have you not heard this show before? <laughs> I'm sorry. Again, we're back to philosophy class. Well, to Hannah's point about living in the world, because trust me, most. You know, the about the only fictional world that I want to live in is the comic book iteration of either Riverdale or whatever the city town is that Richie Rich lives in. Because Richie Rich living in that world would be amazing. He would take care of everybody. That's a side <laughs> note. Um, in the good place, uh, we're just now talking about you know Janet versus Alexa and things. You know, Janet is sentient and Janet is moral. And so she's there to take care of us. And, you know, yes, would I want to live in a world where, and when you think about just the whole of the show, the whole of the good place and the overarching metaphor of the good place, we're talking about a world where people are kind of working together to help each other. I mean, that's the moral of the show. Like we're better when we're working together, to support one another. I don't know if I ever really have gotten that message from any other show. Like, you know what? We'll be okay if we work together and we'll be like, that's yes. so simple, but it's so yeah. comforting. So to I'm, your, I'm with you on that. Yeah. To, to your point, like they kind of conceived of the first season and this is the big spoiler for the first season. So turn us off. Last chance is that like they, re- they reveal, you know, that like the good place is actually a modified bad place and they're literally in hell. And they, you know, were inspired by John Paul Sartre's like idea that like hell is other people. But by the end of the show, they flip that script and it's actually that like heaven is other people because the things that give your life meaning are the relationships you build and you become a better person through learning to care about 
other people, people who are vastly different than you uh, <laughs> as well. Because like there, there is nothing really that you can see on the surface when you meet the four main characters that like they, that they share. Oh no! And the Siri, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> So no, 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 no. Just so, so everybody knows, I probably didn't edit that out because the fact that that happened right then and there. Just really <laughs> makes it. I was going to say the big. I just fi- don't talk for the rest of the episode. <laughs> the big final moment of the show is someone doing something that's just nominally nice to someone else that, that puts them a little bit out of their way, and that's like the big final message: is hey, do something that's a little nice for someone else and less selfish for you, and mm-hmm. the world is better. Well, and. Uh, I, I will recommend that if you watch The Good Place, go listen to Good Place, the podcast, which is basically all the DVD extras that they don't put on DVDs anymore, where they have all the cast and crew and all the I do mean all the crew come and talk about the show. And one of the points they made about that last scene was uh, for the person who delivered the letter to Michael, they said, it's not that it, like, it's not that this made you a better person or you made your day better. It's like it made your day one percent better. But that's all. But you're one percent better off because of that. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Like you've got a funny story to tell about an old man saying, keep it sleazy. And uh, <laughs> that, that makes your life a little more interesting. <laughs> so it's not, not like it radically changes your life, but you're a little bit better because of doing something good. So like one thing I wanted to talk about was like, there is like clearly an ethical thrust to this show. Uh, it, I mean, it, it literally, I don't know. I don't episodes of, <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who for some reason are sticking around, uh, but if not watching the show, like, like Chidi is an ethics professor who literally teaches things like the trolley problem or Kant or Aristotle or whatever it is that week. Um, so like, what are the ethics the good place leaves us with? Like, is it, is it neo Kantian? Does it, as like Robin James, uh, that would imply that the, in philosophy you can have answers. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, they certainly try. <laughs> yes, they try, but uh, that's the nature of philosophy: is that you don't get answer an answer for it. You come to a conclusion, and then someone else will come along and say, uh, "Maybe, kinda, but what about this?" <laughs> and maybe not. Do they try? And see, here, that's one of the things that I one of the things that I actually did like about this show that is weird for non academics. Uh, you're right. Like the, in the nature of philosophy is there are no, I mean, the nature of the academic pursuit of philosophy is that there are no answers. It is the one discipline where the entire purpose is for philosophers to disagree with each other. And, and you sort of miss that in sort of pop philosophy. Like I, like if you watch just random philosophical study YouTube videos, most of them have a, and the meaning of life is this kind of answer to them because, you know, I read my favorite philosopher and he says this and blah, 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 blah. But the good place sort of understands the academic pursuit of philosophy. Um, that final episode has Chidi having, you know, in, in the good place in heaven, he's having his weekly philosophy seminar seminar, and he's standing around talking with many other philosophers, some real, some fictional, some actual actors playing there. Yeah. Some Um, of them were the, uh, the philosophy consultants on the show showed up (laughs) like having, yeah. And they're all in there and they're discussing it and they're arguing about the principles of a book that one of them wrote because, well, I don't think that it really means this even. It's like, but I wrote it. It doesn't matter. I, you know, I see, you know, I see it this this way. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a literal death of the author that I think, um, that I think is weird. It's, it's, it's a weird conceptual place to sort of argue from if you are not into philosophy, right? Like if you're like the idea of, of approaching a question with no answer because there's knowledge value in having the discussion and, you know, resolving nothing, <laughs> you know, you know, like there, that, mm. that, that is, but I mean, that's, that's kind of a thing that we sort of do in academia. And I think we take for granted, but don't necessarily, um, I don't know if I want to say explain, but we don't necessarily sort of show why that's valuable to non-academics all the, all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, well, one of the main quotes that they use during this episode, I can't remember which book it was that they're referencing, but it is the working out the terms of moral justification mm-hmm. is an unending task. Like that, that is becomes one of the, the, yeah, that's what we owe Scanlon. each other by, yeah, Scanlon. Okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, reading. Oh, you have because I just like listened the to the, years, uh, yeah. the the good place the podcast. Mike Sure was talking about having that uh, quote, and he said this is actually partly an, an acknowledgement that it took um, 
Eleanor shell shocked, you know, multiple Jeremy Baramis to finish the book because it was the one philosophy book he couldn't finish. It is, um, and, that, it is, and that's the last line yeah. of the book. <laughs> he's a, a Neo Kantian, so of course I read him. Uh, like literally one Fourth of July, I was reading What We Owe Each Other, but uh, it's about as much of a slog as like the critique of judgment. If anyone has tried that, <laughs> well, Mike sure described it as um, it kept engaging in arguments that hadn't been presented to him as a reader yet. And so he had to go read like five other books to understand <laughs> the premise of this, <laughs> this one line in this book. <laughs> uh, I don't think a lot of it, but despite like us thinking of like philosophers and even like literary critics as great academics and thinkers, we don't always write super well. Um, yeah. Or excessively, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, b- both. But yeah, like we're we're always working on questions. But what's interesting to me is like they like so like they've been experimenting with like what should the afterlife look like? What is like the most like ethical way of living? And this like of course is like parallel to a lot of like questions we have about our own society. Um, for instance, like a couple years ago, uh, uh, Kelly Hayes, who's like a writer and organizer, suggested that the good place was really an abolitionist show and anti-prison and just like a couple of episodes ago they introduced the essay putting cruelty first um where like there are there is talk about like you know you commit a crime like smoking weed and then the punishment is like cruel and there's an asymmetry there michael shore talks about an interview we'll link to and they actually had like uh activists from black lives matter come in and like consult so like it's definitely parallel in our life but the thing they land on to fix the good place because once you get to paradise it's boring and it's a slog because you're just forever in paradise and you don't have to work for anything is to basically reinvent death Mm -hmm. like we don't know what's going to happen so like it gives our life more meaning so like did did the good place do anything but like just reinvent the world we're living in now with just more chances to like think about our actions and how we can continue improving that's one of the things i've been wrestling with about the finale because i i read a lot of reviews that loved the finale and i'm like I was it was good, but not great. I don't I don't quite get all the praise that's going on. You praise, praise the, the show, show that way too. Yeah, praise the show all you want. It is a great accomplishment. But I thought the finale uh, was missing something. And one of those things was that uh, their solution to giving the afterlife meaning is that you have to reintroduce death. And I actually thought that what they did with Tahani was the better solution. Was it's not that afterlife is the eternal vacation. Afterlife has, and life has meaning because you have purpose. And so their mm-hmm. their argument was death gives life purpose when it's actually purpose gives death meaning. If you have a purpose in life and it gets cut, then death has meaning. Whereas uh, if we're, um, it's not that knowing that there's an end point gives life meaning. It's actually the, for me, the inverse. I actually thought the Tahani thing was really interesting as well. I, I also, like, we should yeah. probably mention that if you haven't watched the show, Tahani doesn't decide to go through the doorway that will be the final death. She decides to uh, take a job as an architect and, and trying to help more people uh, right. achieve their goal, get into the afterlife and so, or get into the good place. And so she has a continual purpose. And my problem with it was, so she has a continual purpose and at least for the time being, Michael has an, has a continual purpose because he gets to be reincarnated as a human. Um, I, I actually, I'm, my I thought that the finale had a bit of a bit of fin- of <laughs> the finale had a bit of finality to it <laughs> because the you know the final death that they all go through or that most of the characters go through um seems actually I guess half of them um it, it it seems to be more of an answer to the vagueness of there are no answers that I want philosophy to be than um than I expect out of the show as a whole. I liked it, but I agree with you. Like seeing Tahani say, no, I'm not going to go into oblivion. I'm going to go do something else with my eternity. It's great, except that the show kind of presenting it as though she had this unique option as opposed to like, I'm actually okay with opting for the, you know, um, uh, Jason, Eleanor and Chidi all get to the point where, no, I am content. There's nothing more for me to do. I shall fade away into, into nothingness. And that's fine. But that seems to be the normal way. And not having options other than the fact that Tahani just magically invents one for herself at the Mm -hmm. end, that felt weird to me. And it's a weird, I mean, I'm getting deep reading philosophy on it, but I sort of want there to be a, um, 
a we don't know what happens to it, which is what the how they presented the door. I don't know what happens when I when I go through the door, except that they showed us what happens when you go through the door. And so no, it, it, it no, seemed a little know. too serious. Yeah, I know. I mean, we don't we don't I mean, we know that like Eleanor becomes like that momentarily becomes that like little voice inside uh, the guy at the end's head. But right. uh, Michael Shore like talked about how he was influenced by Buddhism and they like, you know, gave Chi that line about the waves returning and you don't know what happens in the finale. Mm-hmm. But like he he talked more about like the uncertainty of what happens when you like go back into the universe and like in in belief systems that like think about reincarnation as well um like other re uh they you know you don't know maybe maybe oh. like you live many hmm? I, I think part of this is that uh the show is about moral philosophy and ethics and that's where it's getting its basis of right. trying to determine what makes a good person and with the goal of getting to the reward in the afterlife it's not about theology it's not right. arguing about the existence of god and the devil and uh this theological view of heaven right, which, uh, which, they, which, which they purposely yeah they're, very, yeah they're very explicit about that but i also think that creates a disconnect of what their ultimate goal is trying to be because you are dealing with the afterlife and especially that last episode starts, it starts getting into theology where which makes it a little awkward i think i think we also can't forget it's a sitcom so in <laughs> yeah, terms of it's, what's it's the, the smartest goal, show on television well i mean yeah and, and in terms of what's its ultimate goal it's to have viewers so that they can have commercial <laughs> time so that they can be successful. And I don't say that to be sarcastic or, or dismissive of it. I was, I actually read another, um, another review since that aired where they addressed this, you know, like basically there is no show, no television show that can air that is completely disconnected from the realities of television, which is viewership and, and, <clears throat> and the, the fiscal component of that. Now, that said, it is the unusual show that airs that dares to address and attempt something bigger than just being an entertainment and something that just occupies some time. I would wager that a large number of the people that watched the Good Place finale, and I'm not, you know, this would probably be true of the series as a whole, but especially that finale, has spent some time thinking about some of the ideas that were introduced in that episode. And I think like that's an amazing accomplishment in and of itself to get Agreed. people to think that's, you know, like, that's really impressive. And um, just to back up for a second, there had been mentioned uh, how this storyline in this episode, the resolution of, you know, what to do to, to fix the good place was to reintroduce the element of death. I don't think that's ex- entirely accurate. I mean, it, it is, but there's, it's something a little bit broader at work there that I saw because, you know, in our, in our real world and in the characters real world, you know, um, we don't, for the most part, we don't choose when we get to that. So we do the things that we do in life. And ideally we're trying to get better. Um, sometimes we're getting worse. That's a problem, but you know, we're, we're, we're doing the things we do, trying to get better. And then it's done whenever that thing is done. And, you know, we don't, we don't know what, when it's going to happen. You know, we, we might be fortunate and it's a natural end of things towards the end, you know, towards a normal lengthy lifespan. We might be on a helicopter that crashes. We don't know. And because we don't know, we can only ever really hope to accomplish so much. The, the resolution that they introduce in the good place goes, okay, you've all lived a life. You all tried to get some things done without knowing how much time you had. Now you've got as much time as you want. And that's not death in the same way. Like it's to me, that's there's calm there because like, oh, okay, I can, I can learn or discover it takes, or it takes away some of the fear of death. Yeah. You get, now yeah. I've got time. So to me, like when I realize that it's, it is life and it is introduced, it's it introduced the concept, not so much of death, but of the end. And there's a difference there, right? You know, like in, in our lives, we don't know when the end comes. In that afterlife, you get to write your own end. Which is, you know, really interesting. But also, if you want to parallel it to the reality of our world, which uh, in that same interview, I uh, quoted Michael Shuren, uh discussing Black Lives Matter earlier. Um, like it asked the question, did the good place actually suggest like an advocate death with dignity? Uh, because, you know, there are there are like questions about like when people can die mm-hmm. and how people can die. Choosing how you decide to die. to die. Yeah. Yeah. Choosing mm-hmm. to die. Like, uh, you know, if you 
and it's a complicated issue that's very charged, um, especially like when people are in pain. Uh, so like, it's not the same because, you know, you can spend in the good place a billion baramies with the people mm-hmm. you love. And then like when you feel complete, go and it's a choice and it's like it's a kind of utopian perfection of death. But it's still like felt like an episode about death and grieving, if only because like the conversation between Chidi and Eleanor when she was ready to go and she didn't want him to leave her. And even though like she still had like friends from her life and her parents and she's parents and the friends they'd made along the way, because apparently I can't talk about things without using that phrase. You know, she <laughs> all of the closest people who she'd bonded with over the episode who were the other humans had all gone in one direction or another and she couldn't go yet. So like there was still like a pain of death where there was like still a loss there. One thing I think the show did really well in the finale, and I understand why we're all wrestling with like with this second door and this idea of like like the the second death basically as as the solution, uh, like leaving that as kind of vague as to what that all means. I thought it did a really good job of uh, the character work to get them ready to go through the door. And mm-hmm. um, again, Mike sure he talked about the. Um, it, it was about them not like learning everything they needed to learn, but like self actualizing, like overcoming their biggest faults is when they were ready. So we're kind of given this misdirect about uh, um, Jason that it's it's playing the perfect game of Madden, but really that you know that's just what he thinks he's ready, but he's not ready because his issue is impulsiveness. He's not ready to go through the door until he actually like sits and waits and doesn't do an action the second it's in his head. <laughs> um, that you know, overcoming his impulsiveness is what got him ready uh, to go. Uh, Tahani's evolution needed to be that she was going to actually help other people and not help other people so that it aggrandizes herself, (laughs) um, which is what she'd always done on Earth. But so going to become an architect actually allows her to really, truly help other people in a selfless way. And then Chidi's and Eleanor's kind of paralleled or or were able to come together where Chidi needed a moment of decisiveness. Like he knew it was his time to go. Um, So Janet takes him to the door and always says, you can sit on the bench until you're ready. And he just says, I'm ready now. And he walks, puts his hand in his pocket Mm -hmm. and walks through the door. Um, And Eleanor's was selfishness and her trying to keep Chidi with her was her selfishness and her letting him go was her moment of self-actualization. So like all that character work really landed well, I thought. And I'm fine leaving the second door as a little vague as to what exactly that all means. Yeah. And then even after that, you know, she, you know, she's ready because she lets Chidi go. But then once she finds out that, you know, even though I'm ready for the end, there's one more thing I have to do. Eleanor stays and, you know, she, she, she stays and she manipulates things such that she can help actually so that she That's such that she out. can help uh, two other people. She helps. What's her name Did from the neutral Claire? place? And then, yeah, yeah. And then, and then Michael, you right. know, she's like, Oh, I have, I have loose ends that I have to get. So, I mean, it works as a narrative trope. Um, and I, I don't know that there's a way out of it. Like the, the, you know, if there's a criticism I have of the final episode of the show is, well, I don't feel as though you, you know, solved reality right i mean like that, <laughs> and that's not well, totally fair to me uh, why did you not answer the 22 anyway? minute sitcom man. yes yeah yeah also they had set up that this was where they were going in that episode so you already right. kind of knew where everyone was going to end up so there right. weren't any surprises in it yeah I, I i liken this a lot to the lost finale because if you remember that and i guess spoilers were like a really old show now um well, let's the, not call it really old <laughs> it ended my first year of college um but i guess it's not so long ago um yeah you're they, the youngest person on the show they're they're sideways, it, it, it's sideways no world <laughs> oh man uh their sideways world is an afterlife where they all get to see each other one last time before going into the great beyond together and they also kind of skirt around the issues of religion by having a stained glass window with a lot of major world religions represented through symbols um and jack shepherd just kind of shrugs his shoulders is like well i don't know what happens let's go find out um and it, it really just felt a lot like that. Like we just followed them to like the literal end. Um, mm-hmm. So this one was, I think, a bit more painful because they didn't all go together. They went at separate times. Which I which I liked about it. I thought I thought yeah. that that made it work. And for me, mm-hmm. <laughs> the show that I, that I would liken it to more so than Lost, which because I wasn't a Lost fan, but um, True Blood, which is not <laughs> about this at all. No, but. 
No, no, but, but well, I don't know how much of it you watch. True Blood, obviously, it's a show about vampires, so it obviously has a trope necessary for the show that several of the characters are immortal because they're vampires. That's the entire point. And they and they wrote into it a concept that they called the final death, which was there is a there are things that you can do as a vampire. You know, for instance, you can voluntarily leave yourself out in the sun, um, which will I mean, obviously, that's a way to kill vampires. But over the course of the of the series, a couple of main characters ultimately end up choosing to just die because they, you know, because they have gotten to the point where they have done all with their immortal life that they want to do. And they are ready to meet whatever comes after that. Now, obviously it's not a show about reincarnation the way good places or a show about, you know, about the afterlife. So they, you know, what happens when those characters, you know, meet the sun and, and disappear, they're just gone and you never find out, but it's the same kind of thing. It's a, it's a, Hey, Let's, you know, there is no meaning to life if there is no end to it, you know, and that's kind of that's kind of what I think the show was trying to say. But then you have Tahani who says, no, there's no end to my life, but I'm going to go on. And then the other one that's weird to me is I wonder about Janet because thank you. Yes. Yeah, because Janet specifically, I mean, Janet essentially gives the Dr. Manhattan ep- answer. I, was, I thought that someone yeah. was going to notice yeah. that. Yeah. She literally, yeah. She's like, I experience yeah. all time at once. So therefore, we, I, therefore we I'm still it. living every point that I've ever spent with you. She says to Jason, but like, she can't have an ending. She is, I mean, she could be, she could be marbleized. We know that there's a way to destroy Janet's from, from earlier, from earlier episodes, but she, you know, she watches all of her friends go through the door with the exception of Tahani and Michael, who Tahani has gone on to go do. I mean, I guess she could go hang out with Tahani if she wanted to, but like, it doesn't appear from the episode that that's something that happens. And Michael was only becoming human so that one day he can meet oblivion. That's like, that's his ultimate goal. So we didn't get to see that, but presumably it's going to happen eventually. Well, we don't know. That's the uncertainty of being human now. Yeah. Yeah. The Derek head did mention the heat death of the universe. So this might all end. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) This is true. Uh, But like, you know, I, the thing, like we, we, when we talk about these like finale episodes to make them not just finale episodes, we try and come up with like something to talk about alongside this like with game of thrones we talk about what makes a finale good and uh Mm -hmm. basically uh if you take everything game of thrones did and undo that you have a good finale um (laughs) 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 had to to get one in uh but like you know this this is a show about ethics and also a show about experiments and so like there are a lot of i think can i can i i guess i can just say fiction um and like literature television movies that like experiment and ask questions about the world whether it's like what happens when the english country house becomes unstable what would happen if we did give like people like the ability to run around in masks and like fight crime or you know something like this like what happens in the afterlife or what does it mean to be a good person like is there a show that or anything else that you can think of that like experiments with philosophy seriously in this way that is accessible to people who like don't want to read something like infinite jest (laughs) well i think uh, i'm sure there are other shows that have engaged with philosophy but what this show does so well is it remembers it is a sitcom so you mm. have dumb fart jokes from bad janet you have <laughs> everything that jason ever says you know <laughs> like it, it, it pricks the balloon <laughs> of uh you know pompous philosophical ramblings um and, and prevents it from becoming like maudlin explorations of the meaning of life uh you know so it it does appeal to that much wider audience while making really funny sitcom jokes about plato and aristotle <laughs> you know Mm-hmm. You know, I another element of, I, of this show, like, what is this, this show about? You know, it's about multiple things all at once, just like, you know, um, and I, I'm always struck by its theme of evolution because, you know, each of those characters, when you look, it's more than just that they started at point A and ended at point Z. It's that they evolved. You know, they started in hell because they were so bad at this thing, that and the other thing. Chidi's indecisiveness, one, which, you know, the, the, when he chose to just 
walked through the door. That just made my heart happy because that was his ultimate evolution, you know, because he was finally able to make the ultimate choice without a second's hesitation. But on a whole other level with the show, there are times I've thought about this, like things that they're trying to say without saying it, one of which being just the state of our world. So for just a second, I'm going to talk about a subject that I don't get to talk about nearly enough, which is white people. Um, <laughs> I, I say this because I now, like I said, I didn't start watching the show from when it started, started. So I, I had a bit of a, a lag, but then it was nice because I was able to just watch, 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 watch. Um, I binge watched it a, like a normal human, but it was, it was cool. But you know, you do that. And one of the, one of the people who introduced this to show to me, she, she mentioned one of her gripes with it of sorts, which was, you know, we have Michael character in the, in that first season, particularly in this ultimate position of authority. Like this is the person who literally made all the things there. And what is he? What, you know, what does the show choose to make him? He is a white, an old white man who knows everything is in charge of everything. But, but, and even then, I thought, you know, but this show, there's, there's more to this. There's, there's a reason I trusted there was a reason they did that and that they cast that day to that role. Watch the arc of that show. Watch Michael's arc. Michael's arc involves a lot of things, but ultimately it's about, about being, becoming human. So Michael actually has to step down from power in order to be human and be better, you know? And through most of the series, really, I'd say up until the finale, Michael is allied with brown people and he is helping them and he is putting himself at risk as much as they are. You know, he is, and he is, he's challenged, he's challenging himself. He allows himself to be challenged. And he grows. And by the time it's said done, like actually, I'd say the last two episodes, because I'm going to mention another character, Vicky, Vicky the demon. I thought of something when 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 he handed over a measure of his power to Vicky and the way that played out, you know, because at first he resisted. She was Vicky came in and was so good at this thing that he was trying to do. He actually super rejected her. She got mad and left. And everybody goes, well, why did you do that? And then he, he had to admit she's so good. If she's that good at this thing, what does that, what role does that leave for me? Now, what does that say to white people? Oh, you know, you have a brown woman who comes in, who is so good at this thing that you do, old white man. What does that leave for you to do? It leaves a place for you to evolve is what it does. So he goes back to her and they arrange a different way for her to come in. And she does. And she's respected. And she takes over that measure of power. And then let's come to it now into this, the final episode. Tahani takes over again from Michael. So here's another brown woman doing the same thing. And Michael now and he steps down and gets the thing he wanted all along, which is his humanity. Now, I don't want to say that that is, was the plan from the producers because, you know, I'm not on the show. I don't know. But they're very smart people. That show is mm -hmm. very, mm -hmm. very incredibly well engineered. I would not be the least bit surprised if that as a thematic element was put in there for a reason. And and I, for one, am really grateful that they did that. I actually would argue that it probably was. Mm -hmm. and, and like I, I don't know how much of a roadmap Cher had when he started the show. Like, I assume there was something because he, you know, he did go a very, you know, four seasons of 13 episode seasons is a four network sitcoms to be in and out in exactly in, you know, in essentially 52 episodes of television. That's real short to say, nope, uh, this is a, what we're doing and we're done. Footnote, uh, footnote, footnote. Yeah, he, yes. he, knew, he knew because uh, he talked to Damien Lindelof for Lost and he was like, have a plan. Okay. So like, it wasn't fully <laughs> sketched out, but like he had a plan. Continue. Okay. Well, in, in casting though, so, and it was, <laughs> it was interesting. I don't know if anybody else watched the, um, the cast reunion show that came on hosted by Seth Meyers right after it, yeah. but they never addressed this. And it was really interesting to watch because what they did address was, um, all of the not famous cast, basically, you know, not Kristen Bell and, and Ted Danson, all the people who weren't famous already, already, they made a point to say, we just want to thank Ted mm -hmm. and Kristen for, you know, they never made us feel 
out of sorts or like they were better than us. They, you know, they, they held our hands the entire way and was just great. And it's a family, blah, blah, blah. But, um, what Marcel said, just watching them all sit on the couch together and talk, it is such a multicultural cast. You know, you have the two white people who are already famous, but everybody else, you have the other three denizens of the good place are, you know, a black man, a, um, Filipino man and a British Indian woman. And that's, you know, like that's, and that's not he, even getting into like recurring characters, recurring characters. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> characters like Vicky, um, characters like Jason's family. If you, there's very clearly an intentionality to the, um, to the racial diversity of the show. And then what really makes it work, um, in a kind of, it, it's a weird thing because, you know, you could have done a whole black lives matter episode and they don't right? like Chidi's just black. It never comes up. 52 episodes of television. I don't think Eleanor ever mentions that he's black once or, Oh, how progressive are we that we're having a relationship between a white woman and a black man? Nope. <laughs> doesn't come up. Um, how progressive is it that we have a white woman whose best friend is, uh, is an Indian woman never comes up. Jason's Filipino never comes up. Like it, it's having just, a relationship with not a girl. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, the, the, even, yeah, even the, I, that that they at least acknowledge, but the you know the whole progressivism of Janet's non-binary gender is sort of hinted at, but only because otherwise you'd never know. It, it's not, you know, it, it's they only acknowledge it in order to point out that it's there, and then it's never an issue of oh, but this is weird because that wouldn't be the good place. I mean, that wouldn't be you know if if that becomes a problem, then it then it would it would sort of envelop the show like i'm trying to oh so the the sitcom ellen where ellen degeneres came out once she comes out well now this is a show about being gay like it becomes the point of the show right and and it didn't let that happen it let it let itself be transgressive about diversity without taking away from the theory from the central theme of the plot, which is this is about philosophy. By in- introducing Brent in season four, you know, they're hyper aware of whiteness and mm-hmm. patriarchy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Also, like, yes. <laughs> they're also like very, uh, also like quick, like little correction. Um, Tahani is actually Pakistani British, um, which is a little different. Which oh, is, is she? Okay. Yeah. Different. Um, but uh, it's, it's not that big of a plot point in the show, as you said. Is it ever but, mentioned? Uh, I think it's mentioned that she's born in Pakistan at some point. Um, okay. Okay. I don't know if it's mentioned in the show, but uh, I, they do mention in the good on the podcast that okay. uh, they talk about casting. They specifically said they wanted a British Pakistani tall woman. <laughs> if you if you can't find that, we'll we'll change the character. But if you can find that, that's our ideal. I think they described her as Grace Kelly um, esque too. Uh, like the the yeah. casting description was very specific. Um, hmm. But uh, because like the world um, is the way it is. I see the quote um, by Martin Luther King uh, posted a lot about the white moderate. And I feel like the show went out of its way to critique that and also just like oh wokeness or like liberalness, if you will, especially with like the good place like arbiters before Michael and Co take over. I mean, immediately by the casting, they're not all white, but they're like, oh, like they're they're like the oh yes, let's like be civil and go along with things and like not make a fuss and like let's keep things like the way that they are, or like, you know, agree and give in. And like that that is like critiqued in its own way without it being made hegemonic positivity, yes. Yes. <laughs> I do. Uh you know, what it like I don't know, made into something that's like very like specifically related to like our politics of today, though you can very easily mm-hmm. make the parallels. Yeah. I mean like I, I, mean, uh, I did see Mike, I think the episode where we met that council was the same episode where Ma- uh, Manny or Jason says, um, like, they can't reject us. We're refugees. What kind of people would reject refugees? And then we meet them and he's like, I got flack for making fun of Republicans with the refugees line. I was making fun of Democrats with that council. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it, yeah, because it, it is a I mean. So I said hegemonic positivity. I will take it to the, you know, the popular to the non-academic popular language. This, they are political correctness taken to the extreme. They are what happens when you are not allowed to be negative 
about anything, even in the sake of humor, you would become that. Oh, everything's got to be good because everyone's okay. Well, if you take that to the logical conclusion, you get those people. They're the they're the Democrats that are mad that Rashida Tlaib booed Hillary Clinton. Yes. Um. So like. Yes. Um, but I, I think, oh God, I've lost my train of thought. Oh no. Uh, anyway. If I, if yeah, I could I, jump I, in then. Punt it, punt um, it. <laughs> well, we're talking about this racial diversity. There's also a class diversity that they portray where it's all over the spectrum. And that's actually more addressed directly. Like you say, mm-hmm. they don't address race directly. They do address the class issues of mm-hmm. um, Jason being lower class uh, or more middle class and then well, lower lower middle lower class. middle team <laughs> upper middle and Tahani upper and that's really the source of conflict at the beginning of how they're driving each other mad is uh, not just their personality traits but all these different backgrounds uh, trying to come together uh, and that's what they overcome are those differences they, as you said it's not about the racial difference and that's also one of the perhaps shortcomings of the show is they don't uh, veer into like showing actual evil. They say there are bad things, but it's not like they ever brought on an actual racist to the, to be one of their uh, test subjects on the, on this, uh, can someone improve test? So like they don't, they don't confront actual evil, but, uh, not, um, but they do confront thing, other things that set an example of how to overcome issues like that. Oh, I remember what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> Capitalism. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I was there with the class issues, so we, yeah, yeah, we can yeah, reconnect yeah. right back in. Okay. But like in our, so like let's say like the point system or one resembling it that may not be quite as funny, like actually exists in the world. Are we like think about ethical decision making? Like okay, like they like they have a joke about Chick Fil A uh, when the judge goes down to Earth, and she's like, "There's this delicious chicken sandwich you can eat." But if you do it, it means yeah. you hate gay people. And so, like, it's very easy to say, OK, I just want to eat Chick-fil-A. I'll eat McDonald's. But then if you go to McDonald's, it's like, oh, they don't pay their workers well. And they have issues with me, too. And on and on and on. And then you, like, kind of, like, run out of places to, like, eat. Or, like, even if you mm-hmm. decided to cook your own chicken, it's like, well, were these chickens ethically sourced? How do I know that they were not being treated cruelly before they died? Also, is it even mm-hmm. ethical to eat chicken? So, like. And, our, and if you're. And if you're not, if you're not eating, even to take the first one, if you're not eating at Chick-fil-A, you know, to make your stance against, you know, against homophobia, then are you essentially, you know, taking away the livelihood of some poor clerk who just needs a job? Right. So like, like there are all these ethical choices and they actually like show this in the test scenario that Vicky sets up for Tahani uh, when she like shows off like how competent she is at figuring out how to do this. Like Tahani's put in a situation where it's like, how do I even respond to this? Like ethically, like what is the best way to move? Like when Kant tells you how to act ethically, you're supposed to follow certain rules and there's a categorical imperative, but those don't really work in the real world. And capitalism is part of it because everything's like connected. Um, Mm -hmm. But like, are there, can can you make ethical choices that are truly ethical? Are you asking, uh, how do you ethically respond to chainsaw bear? <laughs> uh, I don't know what that is. Chainsaw bear, it's a good place. Oh, your favorite oh, show. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, yes, yes. I, I, believe I said that. I said that and I flashed and I was like, oh, no. I thought, I thought it was like, uh, there's, there was like a joke about on Superstore, which comes on um, around the same time as The Good Place on NBC. There's a joke about like lasagna bear and I thought it, I was thinking like YouTube video anyway <laughs> not important uh lots of thoughts anyway yes uh, how do I mean how do you ethically respond to chainsaw bear capitalism is like chainsaw bear you don't know what to do <laughs> wow. I, I think doesn't Michael at one point have the monologue about like once upon a time on earth you gave a rose to your mother and that was worth a certain number of positive points and now if you give a rose to your mother it's worth negative points because you're increasing pollution and and child labor exactly. and <laughs> you know, like everything is because capitalism. It's also interconnected that that one simple act is has been transformed, and they never updated exactly. their system. Exactly. So, is it possible to be solely good in the world? And I actually think that the show made the compelling argument that like you can't just do pure good because of how the yeah, I, I agree. Mm-hmm. I think it's impossible. I think that's the. And I mean, we can all take how we read the show on our own, but um, but I think when they when they look at the um at the point system. I think the entire point of the show to me is that the point system can never work. You can never have truly 
you know, there any action is such a butterfly co- effect of connections that um, uh, what's oh there's a <laughs> this is going way back. There's a role playing game called the Teenage Mutant Ninja Tur- Ro- Tur- Turtles role playing game that came out. I don't know whenever that whenever they were hot, like late eighties, early nineties and very popular math. <laughs> no, no, whenever they were, whenever they were, whenever they became really hot originally and the, there's an alignment system in the, in the, um, in that game, much like every Dungeons and Dragons kind of wrote, you know, I am going to be chaotic. Good. I'm going to become lawful evil or whatever. And there's a point in the book where it goes through, here are all the alignments. And then there's like a, one or two page rant from the author of the book that's basically you may notice that there's no neutral alignment and then he goes off on it has nothing to do with the game but he goes off on the uh, he goes off on a rant for like a page of why there's no neutral alignment because it's impossible to be neutral because if you were truly neutral then you would never act because any action you make would just disrupt the universe too much. You'd just stand still until you died. And then you wouldn't even be able to do that because your death would affect the universe too much. And he just basically goes off on the, you cannot, you cannot make decisions basically based solely around the stance. But I think that you can extend that to any of the alignments, right? You can't make totally good decisions because no matter what you're always going to have, unintended consequences which is something that they discover like in the second season of the show it, it you know you cannot do that um i think i've told the story on the show before that like I, I i got into an argument at one point about me supporting salvation army and you know why do i you know people say well you shouldn't support salvation army because they're homophobic and it's like i know that and it sucks but on the other hand when i was a poor kid they clothed me so i didn't freeze to death in the winter so like Mm -hmm. like i understand the negative points but there's that whole big positive point of these are the people who gave me a coat so that i could go to school means something to me in a way that you know yeah i realized that when i put you know a quarter in the little pot like i'm also supporting that and there is no good answer there's no it's not really a point system a point system can't really occur so how do i make decisions i don't know what feels right at the time you have, to assume, that, inside your you head. have, to, you, you have to assume your quarter goes to the coat not the other stuff <laughs> yeah <laughs> we also make our decisions like i when that was one aspect i felt like even the show wasn't care about and and i'm recognizing it's a sitcom it's not meant to it's meant to at at best it's meant to start a conversation but it's not meant to like really sum it up you know we control what we have the ability to control in our lives so you know i may not have the ability to 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 affect change for this wide group of people but i have the ability to affect some change here more locally so I might, I might, I opt for this course of action, you know, and yes, there might be the larger, the larger um, things to consider based on that, the things that ripple out from that. And some of the effects of that will be positive and some of that might be negative, but, but you know, it, it, we, we, we have to act on what we reasonably have the ability to control. And then, you know, once we've, once we can kind of sort of get some control over that, then I think then you start looking outwards, like how do, okay, how do I do this same thing, but better, you know? So I, that, I mean, and maybe that's just me and who knows, maybe my little half up, 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 up in the bad place real fast. But I just, I, I, I that, that was one aspect that I felt like I, I get what they're saying. I get what they're doing. I get that, that inner, that I would being good isn't easy. You know, it's just, it's, it's not, but I also don't think that being, making good choices is impossible either. So I feel like what you're describing is a lot like what Marxists have kind of turned to in terms of political action in like grassroots organization or ideas of like self-organization where people like move locally and that eventually turns into a global action, Mm -hmm. Um, which I, I think that like the reason why people have turned to like ideas of, you know, I mean, like this is kind of what the good place did, like six people, well, four people and a demon and a Janet, like, all you know, all like started like in this world together, eventually some of them like basically shut up and sat down and listened to Chi and tried to do like small things that would make things better. And then that 
eventually like rippled out into a larger system. So like change would come from below instead of a hierarchical, like one dictator guy taking over and saying, all right, here's how we will fix the world based on my plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that. This this isn't a show about nothing like Seinfeld, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I think, I think everything's a little about something because like, you know, even like taking a neutral or like nothing stance is still taking a stance, whether you want to admit it or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also learned today, not today, but last week that Schmoopy comes from Seinfeld. (laughs) (laughs) Fun fact. (laughs) (sighs) We we will link to that in the show notes right under the 100th monkey phenomenon. <laughs> this is going to be a very weird conglomeration. Yeah, so this, show had, this episode we've had comp, we've had the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle role playing game, Seinfeld, Schmoopy, One Hundred Monkey. Like it's this well, is a, a free flowing conversation. Much like the topic we're discussing, the good place. This is the smartest summer show on podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's what we strive I, for. I'm, I'm sorry. Isn't one of, isn't one of our reviews one of our very few reviews? Something like they are very good at not being able to take themselves seriously while saying something intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> so we've resolved uh, nothing. We, we resolved. We resolved something. Okay, it's time. To, it's time to go through the green door. <laughs> the good place is a much better series finale than Game of Thrones. <laughs> and the best show on television still. No, no, not on Netflix, no, no. right? And- <laughs> it's the best show on Netflix. You heard it here first. Uh, Riverdale's on Netflix. Nope. <laughs> where, I had to think about it. It's like, nope, I think they're available on Netflix. <laughs> actually, Netflix. Netflix not. Fun fact, Netflix actually kind of saved Riverdale because it was like one of the few shows ever to grow its audience after it premiered because people caught up on Riverdale on Netflix yeah. and then watched the season two premiere live. Yeah. Uh, so I know my Riverdale facts, too. <laughs> nice job. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think we have resolved that The Good Place was a good show that yeah. if nothing else made people think about stuff that they don't normally think about, which is the purpose of art, I'd say. And the purpose of life. One of them, yes. Well, in the meantime, I'd like to thank all of our, this is a big show, all of our guests for joining <laughs> us this week. Uh, Marcel, where can people find you? Everywhere. You can find me, <laughs> find me online. You can find me, uh, of course, at the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, working on our comic book, Hutzpah, when we've released our advanced edition of that, volume four. Uh, feel free to contact us. That's available on Amazon and things as well. And uh, we, we have the final, final version of that ready. That should be ready later this month. So stay tuned for information. We'll have some events in March. Uh, so that's that's the most interesting, exciting thing to about. <laughs> definitely will come up and john uh well you can hear me occasionally on the protagonist podcast uh and also as uh wrap up we, we talked a lot about the content of the show but let's also acknowledge what a cast what a group of writers they had mm-hmm. that's not going to come yeah. around again for a while yeah and Joe. Uh, I host the Protagonist Podcast, a weekly discussion about great characters, great stories, and a lot of the voices you've heard here, you can also hear on the <laughs> episode of the Protagonist Podcast. Uh, Palindrome Hannah. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Hannah Lee Rogers, where I post nonsense currently about Thomas Hardy and mansplaining. Uh, also- <laughs> <laughs> So basically, I haven't changed since college. Also, if you want to read what I think about Kant, you can read my article on Kant and Jane Austen at 18th Century Fiction. Mm-hmm. Yay. And Wayne. I'll be hanging out with about 99 other monkeys. <laughs> oh, so are you the 100th monkey? I'm the 100th monkey. <laughs> I, I was waiting for that punchline. I'm, I'm the tipping point. I, uh... <laughs> Uh, yeah, my, my blog, wayne-wise.com, which hasn't been updated. Um, and that's about it these days. Mm-hmm. And you can follow me on Twitter at Chris Maverick or on my blog at www.chrismaverick.com. Also really bad at updating these days. Dissertations are hard to write, people. They take up a lot of time. <laughs> And you can follow the show on Twitter or 
Instagram or Facebook, all of the places at Vox Popcast. You can follow the show's blog at www.voxpopcast.com where we post about what we're talking about next week and give you a chance to chime in and give us your thoughts so that we can address them on the show. If you enjoy the show, and we certainly hope you do, please subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever the hell else you get podcasts from. I don't know why every podcast host says this every week because obviously you know where you can get podcasts from because you're listening to us and it's a weird thing. I don't know. But anyway, if you do that, we would appreciate it if you leave us a five star review, especially on Apple Podcasts, as that gives us points in the algorithm. This actually makes sense this week. It gives us points. It makes us more popular. You get into the good place. We get into podcast superstardom. We are super happy and super thankful, and we will thank you live on the show. And um, I would like to thank once again, all of our guests for joining us. Definitely check them out in their places. I would like to thank you at home for listening. I would like to thank Maximilian of Thoughtform Music for our epic theme song, building ever so more epically and playing us out. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Holy mother forking shirt balls.